Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right. Good afternoon. I want to thank everyone for coming. My name is John Bartol. I'm uh, actually with Microsoft IT, and it is my distinct privilege to welcome Dr. Alex Pong to the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Alex is a professional futurist with a uh, PhD in the history of science. He's a former Microsoft Research Fellow, a visiting scholar at Stanford and Oxford, and his writings have appeared in Scientific American, American Scientist, and other academic publications. He also happens to be one of my college professors <laughs> and a dear friend of mine. So I'm very pleased to be here today to introduce Alex and his work. He's here today to talk about The Distraction Addiction, the book which I will admit I have read with my phone and my Surface squarely put away in another room, uh, draws upon Alex's work in the contemplative computing space, which he first came to in 2011 when he was a visiting researcher at our uh, Cambridge UK facilities. Uh, he'll be the first to tell you that contemplative computing sounds like a bit of an oxymoron. Uh, but his work in the last several years has focused on how we can be better approach and use information technologies to make us more focused, more mindful, and protect us from being per perpetually distracted, which, given where we work, doing what we do, and what we aspire to be as a devices and services company, could definitely come in handy. So with that, please join me in giving Alex a warm Microsoft welcome. Thanks, that was great. Um, thank you very much, John. John, uh, he was too modest to mention, but John actually was um, probably sort of my, uh, well, you're not supposed to have favorites, but really was sort of my favorite student when I was at Stanford. Um, and it is, uh, there is this sort of deep Microsoft connection to the project that uh, I would be very remiss not to acknowledge at the outset and sort of as fulsomely as I can, um, because this project, sort of the book and sort of, the, sort of all of the work I've done on this never would have happened were it not for the amazing generosity of Richard Harper and the Socio-Digital Systems Group, um, who you know, Richard um, was kind enough to offer Sort of a, uh, offer me the opportunity to come to Cambridge and spend, you know, three months in the dead of winter. Which, if you've ever been spent time in England, you know, is a really good time to stay indoors and read and or to work on stuff. Um, and so, sort of, it's uh, and uh, at sort of a personal level, I and mean, Richard's work himself and his uh, sort of his work in Abigail Sellens on affordances and the myth of the paperless office was stuff that I had pretty much committed to heart. Um, and so this is, the, the, there were parts of this book that follow very much on of, uh, their work and Richard's subsequent work in texture and communication in the digital age. Now, I should say that the, the, or the Distraction Addiction is a book that's focused very much on sort of everyday users, and it's written for um, as general an audience as sort of Little Brown could, my publisher could sort of um, uh, encourage me to, to write for. And so while I think that there are some potential, there are sort of implications in this work for things like software design or service design, it's not something that sort of I attack very directly today. Um, but what I'm going to do is sort of talk, uh, read from a couple parts of the book that I think are sort of have, or, or I hope will be particularly interesting and particularly rich in implications. Now, as John had mentioned, uh, or before I became a or a futurist and technology forecaster, I studied history of science, and I started work on this project uh, largely out of a per, sort of a kind of uh, a per, sort of a personal interest, but really sort of a personal crisis. When you're a futurist, you spend a lot of time working for, it's a lot of project stuff. Um, it's very client focused, very sort of delivery focused. And so you spend a huge amount of time bouncing from one thing to another, deal, you know, putting out fires, traveling, that sort of thing. And after years of that, I felt like it was having a significant effect on my ability to think, uh, my attention span. If, uh, if any of you have read the opening 
um, chapters of Nick Carr's book, The Shallows. I think he nicely describes the kind of situation that some of us find ourselves in after years of, sort of, wor of working at a kind of high pace with trying to incorporate a lot of information very quickly. Now, as an historian, one of the sort of things I did in the course of trying to make sense of this problem and to make sense of how to, or of, uh, how to get past it was sort of to look to the past. And it, what I wanted was to figure out if it was possible to move beyond the kind of uh, assumption that our engagements with information technologies leave us perpetually, to, to sort of open us to the danger of being sort of constantly distracted or having our attention fractured as a kind of inevitable consequence of either the way our brains work or the way that technologies work. And that sort of there is a kind of inherently sort of dehumanizing aspect to this. That in essence, um, living in a sort of uh, high tech age sort of makes us all into some sort of, sort of less than human cyborg. But if you look at the very deep history of technology or the history of our relationship with technologies, in work like uh, sort of cog there's a field called cognitive archaeology, for example, that gets into sort of the history of essentially sort of the history of the mind as revealed by sort of the material culture, as well as evolutionary psychology and anthropology and the history of tools. What you find is that sort of far from being a kind of, sort of process that is alienating or dehumanizing, that Engage, very deep, constant engagement with technology at a really sort of profound level is part of what makes us human. That humans have literally never lived in a world without tools. That our ancestors' brains, a couple million years ago, um, began expanding dramatically at about the time they began to make and use stone axes like these. This is an axe that is about 1.2 million years old. Um, it still has its edge, and as you can see, or of the hand, or human, or of our hands have evolved in the last million years, but not so dramatically that you can't hold it perfectly still today. And the expansion of our brains about the time that we began using, making and using tools like this helped increase our ancestors' capacity not just to make these tools, but to form abstract ideas about how they could be used, to remember those uses, and to teach them to others. And furthermore, other parts of our bodies have changed to enhance our ability to use technology, but also has increased our reliance upon it. So the development of bipedalism allowed our ancestors' hands to specialize more in feeling and grasping rather than in walking. But, and this, in turn, made them more tool-friendly, but also made us more dependent upon those tools to survive. And another, you know, a nice example of this is that for the last couple hundred, uh, for the last million or so years, humans have eaten more meat than gorillas or chimpanzees, our nearest or of, uh, or of, uh, nearest or of uh, simian cousins. But our species has not developed sharper teeth or, more f or greater speed as a consequence of this. In fact, our teeth and jaws have become weaker as the amount of meat we eat has gone up. And why is this? Well, the argument is that our teeth evolved to consume cooked meat. Um, cheese came later, but still. Animals were killed using technologies like spears and traps, and then the meat was cooked over fire. And there are good reasons for this. It's the proteins are easier to break down, the food is e easier to digest, you get more energy from you know, the or of same amount of flesh. And we're also less furry than our primate cousins and walk and balance differently, which allows us to make and use two other ancient technologies dating from about 170,000 years ago, um, clothes and the first rudimentary shoes. Now, this is a kind of, this is a kind of deep relationship that's not just confined to um, sort of objects that we use to sort of kill and eat other things. The development of writing um, also allowed us to begin several thousand years ago to offload memory onto devices, to communicate at great distances, to abstract and analyze everything from stellar motion to long distance trade. 
In other words, sort of the kinds of effects we began to see, or the consequences of writing, um, were really not dissimilar to the ones that we see with computing technologies today. So it turns out there's a long history of our increasing ability to not just use technologies, but to become deeply engaged, to become entangled with them, um, to build what Andy Clark calls extended minds. Now Clark, who's a, or a philosopher at the University of Edinburgh, and his friends argue that the boundaries between mind and body, and even the boundaries between mind, body, and tools are actually fuzzier than we realize. And within philosophy and cognitive science, I will acknowledge that this is a sort of contentious argument, and there are plenty of people like Jerry Fodor who say this is total nonsense, but I'm just going to run with it. They argue that it's wrong to think of the mind as being principally contained by the brain, but rather propose a, a model of an extended mind in which brain, body, and devices, and even to some degree social networks, are all entangled together. And this kind of entanglement allows us to extend our physical and cognitive abilities, you always have to have a baby picture in a talk, um, to do things that we could not do with our bodies alone, to accomplish tasks more efficiently and easily or quickly, and to achieve a kind of mastery that lets us lose ourselves in our activities or in our work. And it stretches our body schema, the kind of unconscious mental map of where your body ends and where the world starts. And this is why a common statement like my, cell, like my smartphone feels like part of my brain can actually express some fairly deep sort of, or perhaps unintentional truths. And so it seems that that kind of entanglement is nothing new or revolutionary. This is Times Square, by the way. It's what makes us human. Our sense of ourselves, our bodies, and our minds are all shaped by it. And indeed, indeed our evolutionary success surviving in a world of much larger predators, outwitting our Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon cousins, um, proliferating as a species, completely spreading around the globe some 40,000 years ago, all depended on this ability to, use, to make, to use, and to merge with tools. And I think it also helps explain why we take great pleasure from using these tools well why we learn to work so intimately and effortlessly with instruments or machines, so much so that the device can cease to feel like something being used and come to be experienced as an extension of ourselves, another sense through which we interact with the world. This is my young cousin who's uh, just turned two. Now, you can see this, for example, with musical instruments, you know, where when you first begin to play an instrument, you're very aware of where your fingers are, of, or of what key you have to be in. Eventually, with practice, though, that kind of clumsy awareness of strings and finger positions or valves gives way to a sense that the, the instrument, as one jazz musician put it, effectively becomes a natural extension of yourself. There's a pilot and military historian named Tony Kern who wrote, likewise, that fighter pilots need knowledge, understanding, and trust of the airplane, and a genuine desire to make the machine an extension of yourself, a real attempt to bond human and machine into a single functional unit. And we also become more aware of entanglement and its pleasures when novel technologies let us do things that unaugmented bodies cannot. So 19th century accounts of the bicycle highlight this. Um, there's one author in 1869 uh, sort of wrote to an audience that presumably sometimes had never seen a bicycle and had never ridden on it, that it is worse than useless until animated by a, the guiding intelligence of which it becomes the servant and a part. It increases your sense of personal volition the instant you are on its back. It is not so much an instrument you use as an auxiliary you employ. It becomes part of yourself. 30 years later, Another writer described riding the machine as riding bicycles as a process where the machine is an extension of yourself. On any other vehicle, you are freight, but here you are moving by your own will and strength. So the bicycle may be the first machine that users describe in such intimate terms, at least sort of mechanical device. And if so, its invention is an unheralded milestone in the history of cyborgs. Now, at its most intense, so entanglement dissolves the awareness of any difference between person and object. You can work 
with it so perfectly it becomes impossible to tell where you end and the device begins. And this is a state that's been described by sort of students of Zen arts like Eugen Harigel, the author of sort of the great, though if now slightly controversial book, Zen and the Art of Archery, where he talks about after sort of years of studying archery in Japan that in the end, the pupil no longer knows which of the two, mind or hand, was responsible for the work. Sort of at its best, bow, arrow, goal, and ego all melt into one another so that I can no longer separate them. And this ability to merge one's awareness and body schema with a device, be it a million-year-old hand axe, musical instrument, writing instrument, bicycle, or weapon, is one that the body richly rewards. And entanglement has a cognitive and mnemonic dimension as well. Um, we outsource to trusted auxiliaries, things that we have trouble remembering or which we can more efficiently store elsewhere. Um, I think I'm probably not the only person who has may memorized maybe half a dozen phone numbers since I first got a cell phone. I know my wife's number and my sort of kid's cell phone numbers, and that is it. All the rest of them I just put into the phone and forget about them. We also store some data at the interface of bodies and technologies. So to give a concrete example of this, um, I spell with my hands. So I learned to touch type as a kid, and after years I can get up sort of on a, sort of on a good day to about 70 words a minute. But when I'm writing, you know, just as you know, when you become fluent reading a language, you no longer are parsing, you know, identifying individual letters and sort of constructing the words out of you know, the phonetic sound. Um, likewise, when I'm writing things, I will type based on a tactile sense of how a word feels, sort of the rhythm that, the, sort of, that your fingers make, the tilt of the wrist. And when I misspell something, I can't always identify exactly what the misspelling was, but I can feel the typo before I see it. And as a consequence, when my children ask me to spell a really long word, I don't visualize an imaginary dictionary and then read each letter. What I do is I watch my fingers on an imaginary keyboard and I read out the letters that, or of, uh, that my fingers are typing. And this isn't the only example of outsourcing some information to muscle memory. Lots of people recall phone numbers and passcodes by imagining the patterns that, the finger, that or of our fingers make on the keypad. This was hard to do in the days of rotary dial phones, but of course today it's a very simple thing. We used to let our fingers do the walking. Now we can let them do the remembering. And one of the last but very striking examples of intellectual knowledge being encoded in the hands is the case of a typesetter at Oxford University Press sometime in the 1950s or so who caught an error in a Greek book that he was typesetting. Now, he himself did not read or speak Greek, but he had been setting books in the language for decades, pulling the type from trays and arranging the letters in print frames. And as he explained to the editors, he knew that he had never made that particular combination of motions before. He'd never reached for that set of letters in that way. It just felt wrong. And it turned out he was right. Now, becoming familiar with technologies in this way, so that they become sort of extensions of ourselves, using them effortlessly, feeling them extend our physical or cognitive or creative abilities, can be a really <coughs> terrific thing. And it can be intensely pleasurable. And it is a state that uh, the great Hungarian-American psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi has studied extensively, um, and which he calls flow. Uh, there are lots of people who have other terms for it, but flow, as he describes it, has four major components. The concentration is so intense that there's no attention left over to think about anything irrelevant. Self-consciousness disappears. Sense of time becomes distorted. And an activity that produces such experiences is so gratifying that people are willing to do it for its own sake, with little concern for what they will get out of it, or even whether it is difficult or dangerous. Now, it's notable how often people reach flow states when using technologies well, when being fully engaged and entangled with bicycles or games or books or smart devices. And I think that there are a couple implications here that I'll just call out very briefly. For one, the pleasure that people get from, the, uh, from these uses is not merely a kind of diversion 
though certainly some game companies have learned how to create clever kind of simulacro flow. Csikszentmihalyi and his colleagues instead find that, as he puts it, the best moments in our lives are not the passive, receptive, relaxing times, but rather ones that occur when a person's body or mind is stretched to its limits in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. So challenge, exhilaration, worthwhile, rewarding at dif uh, difficult activities and an intense awareness of them are what produce flow. And then that in turn turns out, he, uh, they argue, to be one of the keys to happiness. People who are able to maintain these states or able to find them are more resilient in the face of or of disasters, be them personal, natural, or what have you. Because when you pay attention to the point that it really reflects who you are, as he told me, what you've done, what you want to do, you fulfill your role in this world. You feel good about yourself and your work. And this ability to pay attention, to control the contents of your consciousness, as William James put it, is critical to a good life. We've known this for a very long time, at least going back to the Stoics. And this explains why perpetual distraction is such a big problem. When you're constantly interrupted by external things, by self-generated interruptions, by, your, uh, by our own efforts to multitask and juggle several ta things at once, these chronic distractions erode your sense of having control over your life. They don't just derail your train of thought, though of course they do that. They don't just make you less productive, and it turns out that they do that as well. And they don't just of have negative effects on your home life, though they can do that as well. In a very real way, they make you lose yourself. Now, we shouldn't turn off technologies because of this. And if, as I've argued, using them can be an immense pleasure. Um, we do them, we, uh, or if we like them because we're humans. And rather, we should demand better ones or demand more from ourselves. And they're practically, I think, sort of good design is practically our right as human beings. But we also don't have to wait for others to solve this problem for us. And I would look for inspiration to a group of people who uh, I interviewed when I was working on the book who are regular users of social media but who seem immune to its effects. And these are people who spend hours a day online without the media feeding what they call the monkey mind. This is the Buddhist term for that part of the mind that is endlessly self-distracted, that can't sit still, that jumps from one subject to another, that kind of chatters constantly. They maintain relationships with information technologies that, leave, that keep them uh, firmly in control, and they have a perspective on digital distraction that is unique. They are monks who blog. There are ordained Buddhist monks, and or of some nuns as well, who spend hours a day in study and meditating, and sort of the physiological and or of uh, psychological sort of benefits of meditation have been sort of well studied at this point. We can talk about it at the Q and A. If you don't already know about it, you probably do. But also hours more posting instructional videos on YouTube, writing blog posts, maintaining discussion groups. Some of them are members of orders that let them pursue secular lives and families. Some of them live alone in the jungles of Asia. Some live in monasteries in various parts of the world. Now, every religion uses the internet to evangelize among non-believers and kind of organize events within the faith. And Buddhism is no different. In fact, some of the very earliest printed books were Buddhist texts, the Diamond Sutra from the seventh century, for example, though these were sort of carved into blocks of wood rather than sort of using movable type. Still, given a, their deep historical involvement in printing technology and contemporary needs as a globally dispersed community, of Buddhist appreciation of the internet's value for communication and coordination shouldn't be a particular surprise. And as Yutadamo, who is this guy right here, explains, he got online because if you want to share something, you have to go where the people are. So central is the internet as a resource today that writing a book on the Dhamma is a bit pointless unless you offer a PDF as well. Now at the same time, they're also, as a group, very conscious about putting limits on their technology use. So uh, as a very practical matter, machines tend to stay on desks or in closets, even sort of those who have iPads. This is a sort of a room uh, in uh, sort of a monastery in Dharmasala. Um, they tend to keep their machines on desks or in closets. 
They rarely, rarely carry around cell phones. And they treat going online explicitly as a challenge to practice compassion and mindfulness in an environment that can easily divert them. But I think what's really interesting about their ideas about, of, uh, about of, of online life and technology um, go a little bit deeper. And I began to discover this when I was interviewing a uh, monk named Bhikkhu Samahita, who manages the website What Buddha Said, an email list with about 8,000 followers, and has a very active um, or of presence on Twitter and Facebook, and when he wants to be alone, Google+. Now, you would not imagine the silence you get with that joke in Mountain View. <laughs> Still, um, talk about wanting to be alone. Anyway, Samahita spends several hours a day managing all of this stuff, and he does it from here. This is Cypress Hermitage, which is a small whitewashed house 4,200 feet above sea level, above a tea plantation in the mountains of central Sri Lanka. He sees other people about one day a month when he walks into town for supplies, and maybe once or twice a year someone will come to visit him. Yet he spends four or five hours a day online um, at, in front of his laptop powered by a solar panel array and a micro hydroelectric generator that draws on a nearby stream. So how does he maintain these two apparently very different kinds of lives? I started talking to him by email asking about this. And I started first by asking what is it that's rewarding and what's challenging about being a forest monk? And he replied, completing the noble way is both the most rewarding and challenging. Okay, well, what's life in, what, what, is, what is life in Sri Lanka like? What's li what is forest life like? Peaceful, calming, happy, simple, he replies. Smiling is the forest. We have a, and other answers to questions are a mix of telegraphic prose, quotations from poems, hyperlinks, and his English is absolutely impeccable, but after a while I begin to feel like I'm trying to interview someone who no longer really has much use for language. It's a bit like talking, let's say, to Yoda. But in this case, it turns out, a tall Nordic Yoda. Because Bhikkhu Samahita, he's so tall, you actually can't get, get all of him into, a, into, into the picture. Um, he was born in Denmark. And before his ordination, he was a physician. He was a specialist in tropical diseases. And he was a researcher in bioinformatics at the Technical University of Denmark. Now, I don't need to tell you how, or if, if, you, if you do bioinformatics, you're spending an awful lot of time wrangling terabytes of data. You really know your way around a computer. And for an ambitious researcher at the turn of the millennium, it was a great field to be in. But he was unhappy with his life. He had sort of issues with depression. And a chance encounter with a Tibetan monk led him to take up meditation, which cured his depression gave, and gave him a glimpse of a new life. He started what Buddha said in 2000 when he was still in Denmark, and then the next year gave up his teaching position, um, entered a monastery in Sri Lanka, and then two years after that moved to Cyprus Hermitage. And this is a remarkable transformation. And I take it as a promising sign, because if someone accustomed to wrangling data and being on call at a hospital can go from a life of technology-enhanced distraction to one that balances the quiet of life in the forest with life online, then maybe the rest of us can learn to be a little more contemplative in our use of technology as well. And I ask if there's a paradox in using the web, which is a medium that lots of people find to be distracting, to teach about Buddhism, which concerns itself with, among other things, eliminating distractions and desires. If one does not crave it and utilize it rightly, he replies, then the lotus can grow even in the mud. Now, in Buddhism, Craving is sort of at the root of suffering. It's bound up with impassioned appetite, and it's the thing that seeks fresh pleasures here and then there. And feeding these desires sort of satisfies them temporarily, but eventually they're going to come back probably stronger than ever. Now, I ask, okay, oh, well, OK, so this is a fairly canonical sort of reply. But what about, so if you spend hours a day online, can you, never, can you really never mindlessly surf the web? It's another view of his house. He actually doesn't seem to understand the question at first, whether internal memories, flashbacks, or external world, IT, TV, it has to be dealt with accordingly. I think I'm not making myself clear, so I try one more time. Does the internet itself pose special challenges that other things do not? 
The beauty of the end piece here make the internet dull and noisy in comparison, was his reply. Now, I know people who can't get through a traffic light without wanting to check their email. Yet, here is someone who's a former professor who is exactly the kind of, who was the information saturated alpha type you can imagine having trouble being out of touch for even a minute talking about a two room whitewashed house in the middle of nowhere making the internet seem dull. Now when you do interviews with people, one of the sort of really interesting moments comes if you're asking questions that reveal sort of based on what you think is a perfectly obvious assumption that it turns out they absolutely do not share. And I realized I was in one of those moments. And I started putting this question to other monks and nuns, and the responses were puzzling and then fascinating. Some of them didn't understand the question, and I had to explain what I thought was evident, that technology is a special source of distraction. Once I made myself clear, they turned it around. Why do you think that distraction comes from the technology? If you start with a distracted mind, the ping of your cell phone and the buzz of the web is going to tug at it, but they don't cause it, as one of them said. Distraction doesn't come from the outside world to bother a mind that's untroubled. Distractions exist with or without PCs, as one monk said. And indeed, as Samahita said, external distractions like technologies are much easier to handle than distractions coming from inside the mind itself. Now, this makes monks uniformly unimpressed with programs like Mac Freedom or Write Room or other sorts of Zenware, which is a term they found rather amusing. Um, and as one of them said, programs and blocks like that are OK, but ultimately we have to build up our own willpower. Only we can be responsible for ourselves and what we are doing. Now, here's why this matters even if you're not a monk. Or the bad news is that there are limits to how much any design effort can make people more mindful. Right? We can support these sorts of efforts, but ultimately of, of dealing with or of technologies more mindfully, practicing contemplative computing, is something that users do. It's not something that you can sort of, sort of impose or sort of create through kind of nudges and sort of, you know, sort of choice architectures. Now, the good news is that we're told often that smartphones and games and social media are kind of like brain catnip, that they hook into the pleasure centers of our brain, feeding us dopamine in cleverly erratic little bursts, um, changing our brains and leaving us helpless to resist. And the example of Samahita and the blogging monks suggests that this is profoundly wrong. They show how, if we learn to treat technologies not as an inevitable source of distraction, but as tools that we can use wisely while mastering our own monkey minds, our own distractible sides, that the shiny, blinky internet, which supposedly appeals to the most primitive, impossible to turn off lizard brain in each of us, can, in fact, be nothing. And it reminds me of one of the wisest Buddhist sayings, which is that pain is inevitable, but suffering is a choice. And this is an idea that's sort of expressed in virtually every religion. And what it means is that loss and death are unavoidable. You know, catastrophes are going to strike. Eventually, we have to come to terms with our own mortality. And it's not within our power to escape any of these things. But what is within our power is, we can, is a, 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 the ability to develop a capacity to deal gracefully with these challenges, to learn from experience, to become wiser and better, and become better prepared for future setbacks. And I think you face a similar situation in this super connected high tech world. The information technologies now are inescapable. They're part of how you work, how you keep in touch, how your kids play, how you think, how you remember. They clamor for your time and crave your attention. They rely on the fact that your relationships with information technologies are deep and profound and reflect an entanglement with tools that defines us as a species. And they promise to be helpful and supportive to make you smarter and more efficient. But too often, they can leave you feeling busier, distracted, and dull. And some say that the unavoidable price of being always on and connected is that one's attention is perpetually fractured, the mind subject to endless demands and distractions. But that's wrong. We are the inheritors of a contemplative legacy that you can use to retake control of your technologies to tame that monkey mind and to redesign your extended mind. In other words, connection is inevitable, but distraction is the choice.
Thank you. Um, we have time for a couple questions. I don't know if there's any particular protocol for calling. You know, do people stand up or whatever? You got and you know this better than I do. So, question in back. Uh, for generation Y, particularly for a generation that's grown up with multiple conversations going at a time and whatnot, does the research show that they're better able to manage those distractions? Uh, as a personal anecdote, I was talking with my neighbor yesterday. Mm -hmm. He was seeing me use four instant messengers and Facebook and Skype at the same time, having five conversations, and she couldn't figure out how I was doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, the I think that the or if the record is mixed though partly it depends on how much attend or if you know there were um, part of the answer is that it depends on how intensely you need to focus on any one of those sort of one of those activities right so maintaining several several slightly asynchronous conversations is less of a challenge than or sort of the several intensive simultaneous ones. Right. Um, I mean, it's like dinner table conversation. Now, I think that there is sort of good work that indicates that really sort of trying to um, sort of trying to intensively multitask to do sort of you know to pursue two different mental activities simultaneously really is sort of really does have sort of a degrading effect. And sort of your, you feel like you're getting more done, but actually sort of your performance drops. And in laboratory tests, your accuracy also declines. So I, mean, I think that so, you know, sort of the answer is that I think it seems even for sort of Gen Y, for people who are sort of digital natives, that the pursuit of sort of multiple challenging activities is problematic. Um, the pursuit of sort of lower level ones is this is actually just what humans have done for a very very long time. If you grow up in a household with a lot of kids, um, for example, sort of you are in effect having multiple, you know, the equivalent of multiple IM conversations. So I would so um, that's my answer. I, yeah, please. This is more of just your opinion. Sure. To follow off of that gentleman's question, do you think that Gen Y growing up? In an environment where all these, all this technology and handsets and tablets is so readily available, mm -hmm. that they have a better chance of being able to find the happy medium versus us, who have kind of gotten used to being brought up in the uh, pen and paper, uh, snail mail, and now all of a sudden we have this thing called telecommute, which doesn't even begin to describe remote work. <laughs> You know, it feels like we're the ones that have the problem because we're trying to balance out this new technology with old world metaphors. Mm -hmm. um, sort of, I will take the sort of the uh, optimistic route and say that um, I think every generation has the capacity to figure this out. You know, sort of the degree to which we are sort of uh, better able to um, or uh, or can more quickly come up with our own. Own solutions may vary with age, but you know one of the great things about neuroplasticity is it means never having to give up on yourself, right? Um, and you know, furthermore, I think that the you know I try, I don't want to make too much of arguments about how spending a lot of time online sort of like changes kids' brains, right? Because everything you do changes your brain, right, um, for better or worse, and so. And part, you know, part of the problem that we have, that I think we have had in thinking about these issues, is that we have a really well-developed kind of neuroscientific language for describing stuff like pleasure or why it is that um, you know Facebook likes or to give us little dopamine charges, but we don't have an equivalent language for describing why it is that let's say solving incredibly complicated problems sort of generates feelings of profound satisfaction. You know, what's the neurochemistry behind finishing your PhD? I don't know. I mean, or if, you know, who the hell knows? However, you know, for people who have done intensely difficult things, who've gotten degrees, who've solved theorems, who've, you know, graduated from officer candidate school, who've raised children, you know, clearly this you know, these things are sort of sat are satisfying in a way satisfying in ways that we can accept even if we can't dis, you know even if we can't talk about exactly how much serotonin or dopamine get generated you know when we look at our th you know when we look at our thesis or 
pain. Anyway, um, so I, mean, I think that or if it's, it, it, the, the fundamental human capacity is or, or to, to figure these things out is available to everyone. You know, so yes. And then. Essentially, you're saying that it's up to us not to get distracted, right? <laughs> so uh, does your book provide some guidance on how not to get distracted? Yeah, so um, it goes through sort of, there were sort of six chapters, six major chapters that talk about um, sort of the kind of uh, the unconscious and physical dimension of our sort of engagements with information technology. So talk about things like um, Linda Stone's work on email apnea and continuous partial attention, uh, about Zenware and why it works. And it turns out that it works not just because it's incredibly simply designed, but because the people who use it want it to work. There's a big element of this that you are making a social contract with yourself when you use that kind of software rather than some other kind, right? Um, the, there's a chapter on meditation and sort of the vet and sort of contemplative practices and how those can be helpful in getting you to sort of recognize what focus is like. Um, then talk about self-experimentation or sort of experimentation with really your relationships with technology or sort of with your devices. Um, and then a section on digital Sabbaths and restorative activities. So, but you know, the sort of Frankly, you know, the book doesn't talk about either, doesn't really talk about specific devices because, you know, in the year that it takes a book to come out, you know, gee, you know, sort of the advice on Gal you know, on the Galaxy Tab One would really be helpful now. Um, but also because I think it's sort of part of what uh, I think it's also really important for people to play or to explore and to play around with these things themselves, right? You know, I think the it's sort of like. You know, the, the old advice about what's the best diet or the best exercise, it's the one that works for you. It's the one that you can stick to. And I think part, you know, the sort of part of the, part of the point of the book is that it's uh, that an essential step to becoming sort of more focused or more mindful when, when you're using these awesome devices is becoming more mindful about how you use them, about sort of what kinds of assumptions you make about them or that they and their designers make about you. Surfacing that kind of stuff is sort of a challenge, but it's one that I think sort of you've got to really undertake yourself if you're going to get sort of you know, lifelong benefit. So, yes? Who set up the Wi-Fi in the jungle of Sri Lanka? <laughs> he, you know, sort of, um, that's a good, you know, it's there's a there's a satellite connection and it's like go you know it's accessible for like 90 minutes a day or something. Um, I didn't sort of I didn't think to ask a, very much about you know how much that costs or all that. there is there is actually he also he also has PayPal um, so you know there were various people who subsidize those kinds of uh, yeah the, who who subsidize the service and so on. Yeah. So I, I came here a little bit late. You probably would talk about earlier on about how to, you know, improve the situation like the mm -hmm. one on the graph here. <laughs> is there any? Yeah, this is pretty much this was this was pretty much my family at one time. That's not good. Right? Yeah. Nobody. Put so. Um, yeah. Well, you know, uh, I talked a little bit about sort of the more gen sort of you know why it is that these things are sort of so compelling. Um, I mean, I think that you know, the, uh, that you know, working out working out the specifics is sort of something that is I can provide guidelines for how to do that, but we really all have to figure it out for ourselves. And then once you get to the level of families, there's a whole other level of challenge there. Um, I mean, I think that the best thing that you can do, the first and most important, is to just model good behavior at home. You know, sort of if your if your kids are you know texting at the dinner table, you know, sometimes that's because. You know, they saw us doing it, um, but you know I think that the other you know, another important thing to do, sort of in the family context, is to actually not flip out about it. There is a huge amount of alarmism over, you know, if your child goes on Facebook when they're 12, they're going to commit suicide because they are, you know, going to be because their reputations will be ruined. And you know, sort of bad things happening to teens is always bad, but 
Um, or to, you know, this can, but these kinds of things happen in all, in many different kinds of circumstances. And the best that you can, and I think that sort of the, sort of the challenge as parents is to help kids learn to be sort of smart and thoughtful about stuff like social media and sort of technologies and games. Just as you want them to be smart about, let's say, advertising. You know, and recognize that sort of that toy actually will not turn you into a transformer. Um, and company, you know, and marketing works this way. Likewise, there are sort of you can there are there are similar explanations that you can provide for kids about or of you know, about uh, about social media or, or games. The other important thing I think is to do plenty of stuff online with them. So I regularly play video games with my kids, partly because I'm part of that generation whose brains were supposed to be destroyed by video games. Um, you know, and sort of you can't let a good prediction go to waste. It hasn't happened yet, but you know maybe it will. But you know, sort of as a way of sort of both finding out what they're playing and, you know, figuring out what, you know, why in the world is Minecraft so compelling? You know, this, I mean, it looks like it was from, you know, I could have played this in 1978. Um, and as a way of, you hope, kind of teaching them some good behavior and, and if you're good, helping them learn to be graceful you, losers is, you know, these things are, these things are all valuable. So, um, but I'll quit there. There was... Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, you describe yourself as a futurist. Yes. Can you share some of your predictions with us? Uh, well, the first thing, uh, yes, but I would have to kill you then. No. Um, OK, so the first thing is that futurists, uh, or if smart futurists don't really sort of, we don't predict. I mean, in the sense that, uh, well, actually, I mean, some of them do, yeah. And sort of when you say something that turns out to be spot on, you, you know, you try and dine off that for years. Yeah, you know, at that point, yeah, it was, you know, it wasn't chance, it was genius, right? You know, I called the 1973 oil embargo, and so I mean, there's a guy named Peter Schwartz who became very famous for forecasting the oil embargo. But, and sort of, you know, he's never let anyone live it down. Now, so what we do instead, I mean, it's a bit like being, at least I approach it as being kind of like sort of like an anthropologist. Um, for you know, technologies that are going to be hitting the marketplace in several years, generally, you know, you can go to labs and see what is sort of what's coming, right? Sort of things don't move so quickly that the sort of that you can't get some kind of preview of what's going to be in the living room of 2017 or 2015 now. And the challenge is to help clients, usually companies, occasionally governments, understand how people are going to be, how people might use these. Um, what sort of, you know, sort of what kinds of opportunities it's going to create, whether it's going to be a challenge for them, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and so uh, that's, so that's the short answer to the stuff that, uh, that I do. Um, the one prediction I will give is, um, or if any of you were working on, on RFID, or in the inter and Internet of Things, the canonical idea of the Internet of Things is officially dead. Or of the whole, I mean, or of there, we're, we're, into, we're into something fundamentally new and the idea of having unique identifiers for every single object that work the way that, you know, or of DNS worked, forget it. Um, there were, no, it's not. I mean, no. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Well, in that case, so I so see. I, I guess that's a, that's a that's a prediction. I, I I won't be able to take to the bank. Oh well. Um, but I mean that's the uh, so um, uh, and then the rest of the work is and it sort of involves um, trying to get companies to think a little bit more sort of a little longer term in their everyday lives. It, that, of course, is a real challenge for everybody. And, who, and it's difficult to know how well, or if, you know, how to do that and how to do it successfully. But a good part of what or if you do is sort of hel helping to try and or if get clients, when they're not in your presence, to think a little bit further out into the future, you know, to try and think two or three moves ahead rather than, you know, rather than just one. So. It's a great place to stop. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.